It is my very great pleasure now to welcome Professor Peter Matheson, the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Edinburgh, to open the first of our Futures Conversations on Health. Over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Lee and Liz, and it's my very great pleasure to join the welcomes to this event. We're all very excited about this event here in Edinburgh, uh, and we hope that you're joining us from various different parts of the world. If it's an unsociable time of day, I apologize for that, but we had to pick a time that would suit the maximum number of people. So um, just to add my words of, of welcome, thank you very much for, for joining us. And I'll introduce the, the speakers and the chair of the first session in a moment. Just a couple of words of, of background. So the um, the, the background you've heard from, from Liz and Leslie is based very much on the uh, notion of the Edinburgh Conversations, which took place during the Cold War, but also to celebrate the modern day role of Edinburgh as a place where we can convene important conversations on the really big topics uh, for the world. And so um, we think of Edinburgh as a place where uh, we can provide a venue for controversial and difficult subjects, often with a an east-west or a north-south perspective. And what better topic to pick for the first of those uh, modern set of conversations uh, than the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And we're very happy that we've been able to assemble such a magnificent team of people to, to kick off the session for us. And I'll, and I'll introduce them, as I said, in a second. The University of Edinburgh has a, a strategy 2030, which is to contribute to the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and today we're focusing on the the global action needed to ensure good health and well-being of the people and our planet, and particularly in the context of the, of the current threats posed by the pandemic and all its implications, not just the health implications, but also the social and the economic uh, implications of it. So today we are going to work towards a set of uh, declaration of a set of principles, which we'll publish in the week following the event. It's very much a collective day, and your contributions and questions during the event and beyond will help us all to identify the scientific and public policy issues where universities such as the University of Edinburgh can make a difference. Um, I do want to say some thank yous. There are many people who have been involved in the organization of the of the series, but in particular, I'd like to thank the Bilan Cooper Family Foundation and the Bilan Cooper family themselves for their generous support of the Edinburgh Futures Conversations. This support has helped us to realize our ambitious vision for this event and will go on to support our program of further events in the Conversations series. So to the action then, the first of our in-conversation sessions today will be to explore the, top, the topic of how the pandemic remains a threat to health and lessons for preventing the pandemics of tomorrow. And we've got three truly global figures, uh, one from Africa, one from China, and one from the United States of America uh, to lead this, uh, this discussion. So I'm very delighted to welcome virtually to the University of Edinburgh. I wish everybody was here in person, but it's very nice to see you all uh, electronically. So we have Dr. Tony Fauci, who is director of the United States National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and chief medical advisor to the Biden administration. And I think Tony Fauci has really become a household name, certainly in the English speaking world uh, in the last uh, period of time, for even for those who didn't know about him before. I have the merit of uh, a medical background and having uh, the experience of Tony Fauci's work on AIDS and on various autoimmune diseases. And he's contributed in many, many ways. But Recently, he's certainly come to prominence with the pandemic. And, and Dr. Fauci, you are most welcome to the University of Edinburgh and to the first session of Edinburgh Conversations. And then we have Dr. Nanshan Zhong, pulmonologist and a leading figure in China's COVID-19 response, himself former president of the Chinese Medical Association. Dr. Zhong, I'm very proud to say, is an Edinburgh alumnus. Uh, and we're very proud to welcome him back to his university, to his alma mater today. Uh, so, Dr. Zhong, Ni Hao, and Huan Ying, very nice to see you. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you to both of you who are both very busy people to find the time. And I should say that we're very proud of the fact that we understand this is the first time that Dr. Fauci and Dr. Zhong, two global experts from different uh, parts of the globe, uh, this is the first time they've shared a stage to discuss this issue together. And we're very happy that the University of Edinburgh has been able to convene that discussion. And then uh, last but by no means least, and I'll pass over to her in a moment, is our chair for this first discussion. Professor Sheila Klo is the co-chair of the Nursing Now Global Campaign and co-chair of the Global HIV Prevention Coalition. Sheila was previously the Minister of Health in Botswana and director of the United Nations AIDS Regional Support Team for Eastern and Southern Africa. 
And so Sheila will be chairing. And with that, I'm just going to welcome the chair and the speakers, welcome all the delegates. Thank everybody for coming and pass over to you, Sheila, for the first session. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where, I, where you are. And let me welcome all the participants and to say just how excited my share the stage with two, these two handsome and great gentlemen. So I'm going to, I'm hoping that we will have a, 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 some time for questions and answers, but this is a packed session and I know we're going to be sharing a lot of ideas. So let me not even go any further, but I'm going to ask a question to our two gentlemen and really invite them to give us opening remarks on whether and how the pandemic has changed life in the world. So I'll start with you, Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much, Sheila. It's good to see you again. And it's really good to be here with you and with Professor Zhang, as well as with Professor Matheson. Um, I, I want to start by saying that there's no doubt in anyone's mind now that this pandemic has completely transformed our entire world. Um, I often get asked as an infectious diseases person, uh, what is my worst nightmare or what is the worst case scenario that one might get in global health infectious disease person? And I've always said, you know, it would be a brand new viral infection that jumped species from an animal reservoir to a human that was respiratory born that had an exquisitely efficient capability of spreading from person to person and had the capability of causing a great degree of morbidity and mortality. And unfortunately for all of us, this is what we have been experiencing over the last year, a global pandemic of historic proportions, the likes of which we have not seen in over 100 years since the pandemic of influenza of 1918. Unfortunately, we are still in the middle of it, although we have seen rises and declines in cases with various surges. I come to it from my own perspective as a person who is a citizen of the United States and who lives in Washington, DC. This outbreak has hit the United States essentially worse than any other country in the world, which I think is going to bring up some questions and some discussions later on about how a very rich country with many resources has now over 500,000 deaths since the beginning. We have had a situation where we've had multiple surges when we thought we had it under control a bit, but because of the interplay between the public health response of having to shut down a country in some respects to prevent the rampant spread has led to economic consequences, not only in the United States, but throughout the entire world, is something that we really need to discuss and deal with the balance of trying to preserve some element of the economy at the same time as having to abide by the public health measures that we know work. This is a work in progress. One of the things that we've experienced in the United States, unfortunately, is that the outbreak occurred during a period of great political divisiveness. So the messages that came from the leadership to the local people in the states and the cities has been one that has been influenced in many respects by one's political persuasion. That has been very unfortunate because the lesson learned will be that if you're in the middle of a pandemic, everyone needs to pull together within the country and throughout the world. This is a global pandemic that requires a global response. And that's something that we really need to discuss, and I hope it does come up. Some very good news that is related to this is what role fundamental basic and clinical science 
has led to a potential and real solution to the problem. And that is in the development of highly efficacious vaccines, not only by the United States, but by China and Russia and India and other countries. Right now we have in the United States and others worldwide, vaccines that have a very high degree of efficacy and a good profile of safety. One of the things we must agree to, and again, I hope that this gets brought up in the discussion, if this is truly what we know it is, a global pandemic, the response must be global and we must have a commitment to equity throughout the world in the sense that it should not be that the only ones that have the advantage of the interventions in the form of vaccines, therapies, and other interventions are the very rich countries. The reason for that is that one, I believe we have a moral obligation to make sure that we deal with each other with a degree of solidarity and cooperation. And B, it is important to realize that variants arise. And if you suppress the virus, in one country, but it is allowed to spread uninhibited in other areas of the world, sooner or later, the variants, the new lineages, the mutants will come back and rekindle the outbreak, even in countries that seem to have it under control. So we still have a considerable amount of task in front of us. It's absolutely critical that we all work together every country in the world working together in solidarity and in cooperation. So I'll stop there and happy to discuss a bit later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fauci. I am hearing a shared responsibility and global solidarity. And the saying that no country is safe until all countries are safe. So with that, let me call Dr. John, uh, give us your remarks on how the pandemic has changed the world and the life that we live right now. Well, thank you very much, Shuela. And uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. So it's my great pleasure to be here, to be invited to join the um, Edinburgh Future Conference as an element of the University of Edinburgh. It seems to me as a great honor of that. So, and also I can talk with the, uh, Tony directly. That's my great pleasure. So I would like to show you uh, some, uh, a little bit of uh, my slides, please. So very briefly. So, so yeah, how the pandemic has changed life and what China has done. So, I see. Yeah, this is everybody just uh, yesterday's data. So, 113 million people uh, diagnosed as having this kind of disease with 2.5, more than 2.5 million deaths in the world. So, I think it's not only loss of life and also the mental disorders like psychological disruption globally. About 30% of the people had this kind of things, stress and um, anxiety and depression as well. So this is some uh, not only uh, impact for the uh, disease and also percentage of countries reporting at least partial disruption. So of healthcare survive, survivors. So you, you can see about one fourth of the global uh, countries had uh, some uh, disrupt, uh, partly disrupted. That's uh, the worst in the low income countries. And also the non communicable diseases related to health services. So also had a great impact to uh, close to 50% hypertension, diabetes, and asthma, cancer, and cardiovascular disease as well. And just very briefly, so how China had done in the last year. 
So um, since the announcement uh, by the uh, six-member national uh, high-class expert committee, so there's a definite, there was definitely human-to-human -human transmission and also confirmed with medical staff being infected. So since then, that's the, uh, the 20th of January. So what happens? Uh, two uh, direction was laid in front of the government, Chinese government. Mitigation, general mitigation, of, I, 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 uh, people think this doesn't work, will not working well because high reproductive ratio make lost the control and other suppression. And suppression costs will cause a great impact of the economy. So having a very painful experience of SARS 18 years ago, and, uh, and also have a main idea in mind, this life supremacy and, uh, uh, and the top leaders and the government. So they immediately to take the other way to, with suppression. So what's that? So I just very uh, quickly to say, lockdown Wuhan, the, the epicenter, a makeshift a hospital to separate patients from healthy person, and also interagency mechanism launched, early protection, early diagnosis, early isolation, early treatment, down to the community level throughout China. And then that's the three, uh, the whole period of the China in the last year, the first period is uh, blocking action. That's, that's a peak, uh, reach the peak and then decline very fast within one and a half uh, a month. And then this has uh, remained the lower le level with uh, almost 10 months. And that uh, cumulative uh, cases uh, reach the plateau. That uh, make us to warm over the period to re reopen the economy and so on. And then in the last few months, we have uh, some uh, sporadic uh, uh, rural cases, actually. So what happens then to the last year? So I think as, com uh, as compared with the confirmed uh, first, uh, patient per million uh, people, that's in China, just uh, maybe the list. That, and also the, uh, uh, the mortality per million uh, of the people. So China is the least. And I think, as, uh, except for that, because we have got some uh, time for reopen, so the GDP, so just like this curve, and uh, the very uh, the, the first half of the uh, last year is declining as well, like the other countries, and then going back, return to normal, even normal, uh, so positive at that time. So that's a big problem for every country's uh, government's policy. We just try to make a uh, balance between containment and resumption. So that's a very important point because, and uh, so the uh, opening, the reopen cannot be started uh, if the uh, uh, pandemic is not well, uh, not being well under control, basically. So that's the, uh, the word should be open step by step. So I remember Tony had mentioned one word, should not uh, in dealing with the uh, opening of the economy or crisis and so on. So should not jump the gun. So I, I remember this very well, that's the point. And the other thing is about the how to maintain and also to return to normal life, to normal social activities. So of course the nat natural effect uh, to, re, uh, to gain the herd immunity. It doesn't work by this way. And it's not uh, unrealistic and less scientific and you inhumane. And that's mass uh, vaccinations, common sense to do that. But as far as my concern, we take about two or three years time with global collaboration, as Tony had mentioned. So in China, we have, the, we have uh, close to 60 uh, vaccines been uh, under delivered. Up to now, there are uh, four vaccines uh, have been approved to be conditional marketing and one for emergency use. And I think uh, uh, in terms of the vaccine dose administered uh, for uh, uh, the, the, the times, I think the United States is the first and China the second. But in terms of the person per uh, being received a vaccination per 100 people. 
So Israel is the highest, and others, and the United Kingdom, uh, uh, thirty percent, and United States twenty-two percent. That's it. That's the data I did a couple of days ago. In China, only three point five percent. This is pretty low. We, I asked my uh, my colleagues in the CDC, China CDC, they plan to reach forty percent at the end of July, it's not June. So that's the data about that. The big problem, I, I think, uh, just now, Tony had also mentioned about, uh, about that, because of the variant, COVID nineteen variants, because of the mutations in the spike protein. So that will be some uh, big problem. So of uh, like in the UK and you uh, South Africa and Brazil, that will cause some sort of, uh, uh, of the uh, reduced neutralization antibodies. That's the uh, paper just published uh, from New England Journal of Medicine. And then the mRNA vaccine will, uh, will decrease the net neutralizing activities in this kind of African, um, <clears throat> Uh, a South African a strain of virus. So in other words, a big, a big challenge to control pandemic. A mutate or virus, COVID-19 virus, will decrease effectiveness of vaccination and also if, uh, decrease the effectiveness of antibody treatment, which is the most effective treatment so far. So modified machines or cocktail antibodies is at emergent. Uh, for the next wave of pandemic. So finally, I would like to mention about since the year. So last year, February, the, my, uh, my, in my institute, Guangzhou Institute of Respiratory Health, had started academic cooperation with Harvard Medical School. We have a very good uh, uh, collaboration and discussion every, every month or every other month. That's the last time last month we have a uh, a webinar, a webinar discussion about how what's the progress of our, our work, and then so it seems to make some progress in terms of the fasting diagnosis and the uh, uh, antibody uh, and also the vaccine and so on. We need to have a global uh, uh, collaboration in uh, in order to push forward our research work and then make. The uh, full, uh, uh, well designed machine to deal with the mutate uh, uh, virus. That's all. Thank you very much. See you Thank you very much. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm excited about uh, the global collaboration in vaccine research you know, as well as registration. And I'm hoping that uh, it gives hope for those of us in developing countries that the vaccine will eventually. Uh, I heard from you the psychological trauma. And you know, it, it is really a traumatic thing in every country. In my own country, we have 330 deaths so far. But in a country of 2 billion, it's actually traumatic for each and every citizen because we know those people, they're not just numbers. So you can imagine. So anyway, let me get back to you, gentlemen. I'm going to ask you a question, both of you, but it's a question where I also want you to answer that very question. The question is, what is the one question you would like those who are listening to consider in light of the stage we are at with this pandemic? Remember, we do have students here, so they would like the answer to that question. So I'll start this time. Okay, I'll start with you, Dr. Fauci. Okay, thank you, Sheila. You know, th th there are so many questions to consider. The one that I think is very important that seems to dominate the discussion throughout the world, but certainly in the United States, relates to one of the slides that uh, Dr. Zhang showed, where you have the balance between the economic considerations and the health considerations. There's a constant understandable need to open up the country and get back to normal. I keep getting asked that question every time I give an interview, every time I have a discussion. Everyone wants to get back to some form of normality. But if one does it too quickly, and as Dr. Zhang has mentioned what I often say, jump the gun or do it 
too quickly, what happens is that you can get a resurgence of infection. So the question is, what is the right balance of continuing to put stringent public health measures at the same time as you gradually open up the economy and open up the country? It's very risky. If you go too fast, you'll have a setback. If you go too slow, you have a lot of the suffering that Dr. Zhang spoke about, the mental health problems, the economic problems. It's a very delicate balance that the students need to consider how difficult that type of balance is to maintain. Mm. Yes, right. I think, yes, can I? Yes, Dr. Mm -hmm. yes, yes, thank sir. you very much, Sheila. Right. So I think, Tony, your question is the, my question as well. I think we had a very had the experience very long time, and then trying to um, to get the balance about that. But in China, I think it's a little bit conservative because of uh, the very painful experience of uh, SARS 18 years ago. So that's a big pro question, uh, the big problem. Hmm. So once I, I have experienced the whole process of the uh, of the disease. So at that time, I think the ones because of less of transparency and uh, for some uh, some periods of, uh, of time, so we have a, a suffer a big uh, uh, problem of the uh, of the, the, the outbreak of uh, <coughs> of the uh, of the uh, disease. So I think that they, um, we just this time, so we should uh, take a very strict strict so action to lock down and then. The, the so-called uh, in the local community and uh, early detect, uh, protection and so on, but that's uh, the that's our experience from the uh, from the uh, uh, event of SARS. But the point is, so we just try to uh, step by step, so to open that and see what's happened, what happened, and then trying to do um, to do this. And that, that's not a suddenly open. That's not uh, that's not the way. So this is always a controversial uh, time for us. So for example, we have take, taken a long time to uh, to, to to think of when we start, uh, recover to, to work. That was the in April. Uh, we we with the host this uh, pandemics so under control for I think uh, so uh, like uh, two months. And then without, without uh, uh, too, too many patients increasing, so we'll start the uh, opening that way. So that's uh, from the very beginning, that's a very strict, strict um, uh, uh, stipulation for the, uh, uh, for the distancing, wearing masks and so on. That's, the, the good, that's good for that. I think that's, uh, I have noticed in, uh, in other countries, I think, so that action is not uh, strict enough. So that will be not uh, enough to step uh, to stop the spreading of that. So I think uh, this is uh, something up to different countries, up to different habit of the countries of the people. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that the, the the problem here are the political decisions on whether to be fast, too fast, or to not jump the gun too much. So, but, uh, okay, and, uh, Anthony, you've already told us your greatest fear in terms of the future of health. Uh, so I think I'm going to Dr. Jong to ask him, what is the greatest fear that you have for the future of health, you know, of the world? Uh, you mean the fear? Yes. The fear? A great fear. Okay. What is the one thing that you fear for in terms of the future of health of the health of the world? Well, I I think the situation is much better now. But I have to say something uh, about this. I think the uh, COVID nineteen is a common enemy of the human being, uh, owing to its high reproductive index. It's impossible to be well under control. So if COVID nineteen remains spreading by any of the countries in the world. So that's the, the, the point. We need to have a, to, to join together 
So the, the to end this spreading in the world, the any decisive action taken by the policy makers must be based on science and the evidence and the best clinical trials. So when uh, mm -hmm. so I, my greatest fear will be so the uh, is politicization uh, of mm. that measure to protect public health problems. So that's my greatest fear. Yeah. Surely we must promote national un unity and global solidarity, as Tony had mentioned. Yes. You know, Sheila, one okay. of the things... Uh, Tony, Sheila, one... Yes, you yeah. told us... Uh -huh. One of the things yes, ahead, that I, I, I want to mention, I had mentioned to you that my greatest fear and nightmare has come true. But now looking forward, yes. what is my fear for the future? My fear is that we will not we will not adhere to the lessons learned. One of the problems that we have had in our approach to global health is that when you have a particular crisis, you respond to it and say, ah, what we need to do is learn lessons for the future. But then when the mm -hmm. future comes, we lose our corporate memory and we don't do the things that we need to do. What is very clear right now is that we have to maintain the spirit of solidarity, cooperation and collaboration and build you know, global health security agendas and networks so that we're all in it together, every single country. And we prepare in a way that we've learned the lessons that were really very painful lessons that we learned from this outbreak. So my fear is that we will forget what we have been through maybe 10, 15, 20 years from now. And as we know, pandemics have occurred throughout mankind. They're occurring now and they will occur in the future. And it would really be a terrible shame if we forgot the lessons that we should have learned from this horrible experience that we're all going through. Yes, I agree. The, um, actually, people are paying pay more attention to the non-communicable disease. Actually, the non-communicable disease, of course, the great uh, um, threat to the human being. However, so this this kind of disease, so uh, SARS, actually SARS had uh, already. The coronavirus had already happened in this century three times. SARS in the, uh, the year of 2003 and uh, MERS in the uh, uh, 2012 and this time COVID-19, 2020. So that's things that's I think that will, will be occurring. So I, I agree with that. So. So should not the lesson should not be forget forgotten. So that's mm. that's the that's true for me. I agree with that. Yes, sir. Okay, but but Tony, wouldn't you say that um the global solidarity that we had for the AIDS response did not seem to apply a lot when it came to 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 the COVID response? At least uh, you know globally, do you think uh, there was a? Did we learn anything from the? from the ACE response that could have been applied better because I, I feel we haven't, but maybe you have a different view. No, I mean, one of the things that's an example uh, of, even though we still have a serious issue with HIV, you know, the idea that we came together with the global fund, with the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, it became clear that we really had a global problem. We haven't completely overcome it, but we now have a lot of solidarity. And I mean, I, you experienced that so much yourself, Sheila, in Southern Africa, mm -hmm. how we, yes. you know, the rest of the world with the Global Fund and with PEPFAR really stepped up to the plate, as we say, with the baseball analogy and really, really took the, a, a great deal of responsibility. I hope that we see that. Because as Dr. Zhang said, and I said also, and, and to confirm it, that it's global. So we've got to be in it together. Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly, again, to yes. emphasize something that both of us said. If we do not completely mm -hmm. suppress this, we will continue to be challenged by variants. 
which have a way mm. of coming back to bite us, as they say. You know, we have been successful in the past by global cooperation with smallpox, with polio, with measles. There's no reason in the world why we cannot do the same thing with COVID-19 by a combination of cooperative public health measures and the application of science to get interventions in the form of vaccines and therapies and other types of interventions. Yes. Okay, that's that very great. So on that note then, gentlemen, where is the greatest hope for a healthier world? And what needs to happen in order for us to realize this very hope and achieve the SDGs, so to speak? So shall I call upon you, uh, uh, maybe John, where do you think is the greatest hope then for a healthier world? And what needs to be done in your view? And uh, excuse me, could you please uh, repeat again? Well, what is our greatest hope for a healthier world? And what needs to happen for us to be able to achieve or to realize this hope? Well, I think uh, so, uh, um, as the Pony had mentioned, collaboration, unity is the most important. Global collaboration, global coordination. So that's the mm. most important things. What's the common enemy? Uh, this is the things. Because the, uh, so actually uh, through the uh, cooperation uh, uh, or the more communication between my institute and Harvard Medical School, we have different ideas. We have different, um, uh, uh, so experience. We can have a more communication and interchange of our experience and so on. So that's very important. So for example, nowadays, uh, the, uh, the adult virus uh, uh, as a victor of the uh, vaccine, so they had developed by Janssen Janssen and also in China as well. So we need to have a more ex uh, experience to be exchanged from each other to improve the manufacturing, uh, manufacturing of the uh, vaccine. So that's the great, my great hope. In, in dealing with the uh, uh, public health problem, just like dealing with the climate, like just like dealing with the air pollution, that's the, we were mm -hmm. the same goal to deal with that. So the cooperation and together is very, very important. In uh, uh, with regard to the how to get it, I think, uh, I think the best ways uh, the, under the coordination of the WHO, will be the best. So I'm very glad the, uh, uh, President Biden had decided to return to WHO. That's uh, the really good news for us, because as you know, uh, United States uh, had the, has a play very important role in the, in the WHO in terms of the fighting the uh, uh, different kind of uh, uh, infectious disease, including Ebola and HIV, and, uh, and, and others. So uh, MERS is, uh, as well. So that's a very important, uh, so we need to join together and then to coordinate by the WHO because we can work out some good recommendations and then to join together to raise enough fund to support WHO and then to, to, the, to, to have a, a better um, allocation equitable mm. for the uh, different country in particular at the moment as I, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, the uh, WHO people has I have mentioned about 10 uh, countries and uh, have, uh, uh, have uh, administered about 75% of the vaccine in the world. So some of the poor countries are the low income country, they have no vaccine. We have to to join the WHO COVAX uh, plan and then to have a better and equitable allocation of the vaccine, in particular to those countries who cannot afford vaccine purchase. So that's this true. is something, yeah. that, that's my hope. That's how to get it. All right. That's my idea. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Now over to you, Tony. I mean, this is your last one. Give us hope. Yeah. And how we can attain that hope. Yes. Well, you know, in in my mind, I mean, I, I would underscore everything that Professor Zhang said, but also something that is going to require a multi-year decades commitment, and that is to make and strive for essentially access to quality health care for everyone in the world so that health is a is really a, a human right in many respects and that we should work and it's going to require a lot of economic uh, improvement in certain countries it's going to require uh, essentially a commitment as a global community to make sure that there's accessible health care no matter where you are and building up the healthcare infrastructure, even in countries that don't have very much healthcare infrastructure now. We have a very good example of success in the delivery of healthcare that was associated with the PEPFAR program when people said you'd never be able to get medications for the prevention, treatment, and care of HIV in the developing world. And PEPFAR. And the Global Fund has proven that to be incorrect with the extraordinary advances. I think we can do that with all aspects of health. So my great hope is that as the months and years and decades go by, we keep going in the right direction of more and more accessible, easy to get to health care for every citizen of the world. That would be my hope. Yes, Thank I, you so I, much. Sorry. That is a great hope. Yeah, no, we, 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 we are running out of time now. But let me just say that is a great hope. And for those the participants, especially the students, I wish I could give you time to ask some questions. But you know what? This was a very packed session. And we had two robust scholars. And you know, they haven't said everything that they want to say. But uh, I want to end. So let's give them a hand, a virtual hand, so to speak. But for me, let me end with exactly what uh, Tony Fauci said, you know, the Global Fund and PEFA, and how that global solidarity actually was very instrumental in making sure that we, we, we can now talk of ending HIV as a public health threat by 2030. I was, as a minister, one of the recipients of that kind of uh, assistance. And so I want, but in my own reflection, I want to now reflect on something that I know we need to talk about when we talk about the risk and care agenda for future health. And these are our noble healthcare workers, especially in this year of the healthcare worker. You know, at no time has the spotlight of the world shone on healthcare workers, especially nurses and midwives, than it has now. You know, they, are they have shown that they are a formidable, compassionate cause, uh, a force that can actually take care of humanity in all crises and in all localities, be it at community, family, you know, clinic, hospital, and indeed, we owe a lot to them. I know a lot of countries have really been able to, to, to appreciate and clap for them, sometimes at midnight or whatever, but guess what? The clubs are great. And you, you and I, the three of us, are healthcare workers. We appreciate those clubs, but in the ultimate, we are not angels. We are living human beings who need to be appreciated in more ways than one. And that appreciation now more than ever should come from better working conditions, ensuring that we have the PPEs that protective equipment that a lot of them have been able to serve without so diligently and with that psychological trauma of being infected themselves or going home to carry that infection to their own family members uh we we do owe a lot to our healthcare workers the very so-called frontline healthcare workers so what we need to do i mean in ending i want to just say that what we need to do differently is to have that global solidarity and shared responsibility to be able to produce more. They are predicted, it's estimated that there'll be 18 million shots 
but we need to be able to produce more, to share in the training, and also to ensure that we encourage each other. Let's face it, in the ultimate, we, the three of us are talking, but we are uh, professionals. In the ultimate, healthcare is a political choice. We need to be able to therefore ensure that our leaders, those politicians, get to improve working conditions, or if that doesn't work, okay, what will happen is that we, the less developed countries, will see our human resources just move on to the developed countries for greener uh, you know, pastures. And indeed, I know that will happen, especially now after this, you know, immediately after this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We need to therefore strengthen and ensure that we do uh, uh, so, okay, it's, uh, Peter Melton, I'm going to come in there. Uh, it seems as if we've got a bit of a technical problem with, with Sheila. We have two and a half minutes left of our allotted time. I'm going to use the half minute, and then I'm going to give Dr. Fauci and Dr. Jong one minute each, uh, and I'm going to ask you to address the question if we invited you back in a year's time to do this again, where would you hope the world is in relation to the pandemic one year from now? Um, so whilst you just think about that, um, I just want to say a couple Did of thank yous. Off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Sorry, Sheila, I picked up because you froze for a moment. But um, just saying thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to you, Sheila, for chairing. Thank you to the audience for participating. Um, I want to remind the delegates that they can post their thoughts on the Q&A function, which is a button at the bottom of the screen. And to everybody in our global audience that's listening uh, by for any other mechanism, they can post their thoughts via Twitter. Okay, I'm, the... having, I'm handing it over to Peter. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, the Twitter hashtag is Edinburgh Futures Conversation. So in the remaining, uh, just uh, just under two minutes, Dr. Fauci, where would we be a year's time, ideally? And then we'll go to Dr. John for the same question. And if there's time, we'll go back to Sheila for the same question. Sheila, I was just asking people to say, in one year from now, where will we be when we invite you all back? Peter, to... will you go on? Yeah. 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 I'm handing it over to you now, Peter. Okay, thank you. Dr. Fauci. Yeah, well, Peter, thank you for that. I, 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 in my mind, I believe that one year from now, my hope would be that we will have implemented vaccine programs. I know we're not going to get the world vaccinated in one year, but I would hope that we suppress the dynamics of this outbreak to the point where it may not be eliminated, but it is under extraordinarily good control so that there can be some steps towards normality. I don't think we're going to be completely normal a year from now, but I hope we're well on the way to normality so that we can ultimately get the world protected at the same time as we get economic recovery so that all the unintended consequences of shutting down begin to normalize, including other health issues that have arisen because of the shutdown. Perfect. Thank you. Well, I hope in a year's time that will include travel and we can have you physically in Edinburgh. But um, but Dr. John, what about you? One year from now? Well, I, I, I agree with that. But um, that's uh, in one year time, I think it's a, a big change, I think, uh, uh, from from now on. But I don't think it can uh, we can eradicate the, uh, the, this kind of uh, the disease. I, I think that that's uh, so basically being controlled. So we have uh, a lot of unpredictable risk factors. For example, the mutation of the uh, virus and what will be happening, and also the uh, um, any other uh, uh, reasons. So, so I, um, I think uh, the, uh, and also depends on the effort of the uh, people, or the effort to make in the people, to make the balance uh, on the containment and uh, the development of e economy. But uh, anyway, I think it's optimistic to go to the right way at the moment. So, so I think in most of the country, the, uh, the, 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 the cases, the culminated cases going down at the moment. So that, uh, and this is uh, the, the future of us. But wh whether in one year's time, well, what situation will be happening is quite difficult to predict. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm optimistic for the situation. The situation uh, in the one year time, I think that 
all the situation is getting much better as compared with right now. So uh, uh, that's what I think. So we need to have to, more work to do to have a global collaboration from each other in terms of developing some uh, effective uh, uh, drugs and uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies and also effective uh, vaccines. It depends. So, so I, I'm not quite sure about one year we're going to what uh, level. But anyway, it's go, it will be getting much better as compared right now. Good, good. Well, I, thank you very much. It's great to finish on a, a note of optimism. It, I think we've lost Sheila. She was having some technical difficulties. But on her behalf, um, may I just say what a privilege it's been to listen to uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. Zhang. We, we have two of the world's great experts. Thank you on behalf of the University of Edinburgh. And thank you on behalf of populations worldwide for the fantastic work that you're doing and leading. And we hope that we will pick up with you in the future as we can take another measurement of where the pandemic has got to and how we've learned the lessons as people have said so thank you very much we knew we would run out of time uh, but it's been a great privilege to have you thank you for joining us uh, and thank you to everybody for organizing and to everyone for contributing and please let the conversations go on so that we can come out of this with some real uh, actions and some real uh, future directions to 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 make sure that we we do learn those lessons and we do make the world a better place so uh, with that we're going to close the first session Thank you very much, colleagues, uh, Dr. Fauci and Dr. John, for joining us in different parts of the world. And uh, until the next session, I'll say cheerio to all the delegates, but thank you very much. And this has been a great start to the Edinburgh Conversation Series, which we hope will uh, continue to flourish for the next few years as we tackle this problem and, and other problems. But with that, thank you so much and take care of yourselves and stay well. Thank you very much. Thank right. you. Thank bye you, bye. Peter. Thank you, Dr. John. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.